Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with Lindsay Stone, an artist and designer living in Cumberland, Maine. Her home and studio are in the country where she is raising eight chickens, two cats and one baby with her husband, Forrest. Forrest is also a maker. Uh, our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home and Design. Don't miss Lindsay Stone's design theory article in the upcoming issue, uh, which will be out in October, or the October issue, which I think is out on the stand this week, potentially. Uh, thank you for coming into the studio today, Lindsay Stone. So I'd like to know, um, as an artist, and feel free to scoot that a little closer to you so we get nice audio. Um, as an artist, like where where does your inspiration for what you're creating come from, and like why do you create stuff, and what what draws that out of you, and why why do you do it? Those are big questions. Um, well, let's see. I I always have my notebook with me, um, so I I guess um, the two bodies of work that I'm going to talk about today kind of began with this idea. Um, I often find myself coming across feelings that don't have like a single word for them, um, mm. at least in our language. I'm, I'm sure in Japan, they have a word for all the little right. things, um, which is, I would love to know those. But um, so just writing down certain moments that I wish could have a word to represent them. Like one that we all know is deja vu. Like what a beautiful way to just, you just say that, but it means so much. Right. Um, so like um, one thing that when I first began, what I wrote down was um, when you're like, it. so deja vu is like something that already happened, but um, this is like present. Or it's a premonition. Oh, yeah, or a premonition, yeah. Um, but like the feeling of when you're, say, saying goodbye to somebody and you know you'll never see them again, or like consciously being aware that it's your last time doing something, um, mm. kind of like recording that in your head as it's happening and you're kind of watching yourself in the future reminisce it, but you're huh. in the moment right now. Right. Um, so I was I was doing a shoot at a chemical plant in southern Texas, and this this guy was showing us around this really nicely natured, funny, interactive guy. Yeah. And I appreciated being around him just because he was funny and, and uh, you know, uh, polite and engaging. Mm -hmm. And when we were saying goodbye, you know, after the shoot, I knew I'd never see this guy again. Mm hmm. But when you say goodbye to people like that, you never really talk about that. And I was just kind of like, hey, we'll never meet again, but <laughs> see you later. Yeah. So that doesn't really mean anything because I'm not going to see you later, most likely. Yeah. But I knew in that moment, like, this is the last time I'll see that guy. And I had that thought mm -hmm. and it was weird. So that needs another word that would be like, like in Italian, how they have a word for like, I love you like you're my significant other and i love you like you're my friend there right, are two different right. um and i can't think of them off the top of my so head so there's five no six or seven different types of love there's arrow switches between you and mm -hmm. a like a spouse or boyfriend girlfriend whatever yeah. there's agape which is um an unconditional love mm -hmm. um there's phil philos like the city of brotherly love philadelphia uh, -huh. uh which is kind of a love between friends i believe and then I think there might be one like a parent would have towards a child, but I forget what it's called. I think these are all Latin terms. Ooh. And I, I think they're biblically based anyways, as far as I've run into them in the past um, as a good definition of the different types of love. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I keep coming still to this idea of like what what really is love? Like mm -hmm. I've had a hard time coming to the definition of what truth is. Mm -hmm. um, which is different than like objective truth and subjective truth mm -hmm. compared to like what is factual truth. I find that to be an objective truth as a fact where a subjective truth is an opinion. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not that an opinion is right or wrong. It's just that that's your opinion from your experience. Mm -hmm. But then there's um, like this weird understanding of what love is and how mm -hmm. there's different types of love. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't know how to categorize that yet and yeah. how to pull meaning from it or really how to pull uh, behavior from it. I, I like that you just pulled that out. I if I was listening to this podcast, I'd be like, oh, I'll write this down. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I feel like the 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 goodbye that you were saying to that person, like it wasn't I mean, that is an interesting goodbye. So there should be a certain word for it knowing that you'll never see a stranger again but like mm. i guess um the the goodbye or the recording in your mind um that i was originally talking about is more for like a a loved one so mm. um like the like experiencing the despair of not having somebody or something in your life again mm. um and have you gone through losing a significant other like that and process that i, I never have no, and I mean, i'm fearful of it it's all kind of i mean sure like expected deaths of grandparents and i guess like that would be one for sure that like saying goodbye to my grandmother i could feel myself watching myself and i just wanted to remember every single moment and so like I it's like I can just watch that video in my head again of the music, the smells, like mm. the sounds. And um, so I can revisit that as whenever I think of it. But, um, you know, just like leaving the feeling of leaving a, a house that you've lived in for a long time. I mean, just we've all like, oh, you're experienced touching on them. all these things that have been <laughs> serious points for me, too. Yeah. So like leaving a house that you've been in for a long time. Uh huh. Like I always used to get really not upset, but I'd hate it when people would ask me to help them move. Yeah. Like we have all these things in our lives that we have to pay for. Uh -huh. Yet we feel justified coercing people close to us into backbreaking manual labor of moving friends. It's horrible. <laughs> but I moved out of a house where we had lived for 13 years and walking out of that home, it, to look backwards at it, before you walked out that door, it was empty. Mm -hmm. And so much had happened there. My kids were born there. Uh, we all those memories for 13 years and I shut the door on it alone. Yeah. <laughs> that was hard yeah. and I was alone. And if I had asked friends to help me, they all would have been there probably giving me a hug, uh -huh. patting me on the back after I forced them to work. <laughs> But I, I then realized like, oh, this is why you ask friends to help you move. Mm -hmm. It's hard, you know, mm -hmm. that that emotional leaving that space of so many memories mm -hmm. was hard. And that was weird. That was an emotion that taught me something that I didn't know that I couldn't articulate before that experience. Mm -hmm. And it made me less resentful. But at the same time, if anyone asked me to move, I'm probably going to pay someone to go do it and just show up when they're walking out of the house and give them a hug and be there for them maybe. Yeah. But that's still my manipulative workaround. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So like there needs to be um, a word for that because then like we could, you mm. know, when you, when you put a word to something, then you'll have to get that mic a little closer. To you. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> it does feel good. I'll move it away a little bit, but you still get some nice. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, there needs to be a word for that, you were saying. Yeah, so like there needs to be a word for it so that you can like process it a little more so that it could become part of our like common culture to like, oh, that's an experience that we all have experienced. And you're more likely to speak speak about it maybe if there is a uh. word to it. Um, now, I, why would it be valuable to speak about an emotion? Um, I'm going to take you on all sorts of trails, but so I've gotten really into, I mean, I think a lot of people have gotten really into um, drinking wine through the pandemic, but <laughs> I've been, okay. I've been Probably. making it a, a master skill. Um, and I've been like, learning so much about smell and taste and associations and I learned that there uh, 
I wish I knew the culture. Um, there's like, say on some island in the middle of nowhere, there's a culture that they are, um, their language is based around smell and tastes like that. Is this a real is, thing yes. or are you imagining no, it? No, 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 it is. There's I, a language I, based around smell. Yeah, I was, um, so it's, it's called your olfactory um, yep. senses. So um, they, it's not like a language based around smell, but their culture is like heavily ingrained in that. And right. so like when they taste something, they would be able to describe so many things about what they're tasting, but like we don't talk about smell and taste so much. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we have like a very limited vocabulary about it. And that I'm really trying to push that. Like I'm trying to push what I am experiencing and it's taking me to cool places. Like my husband Forrest, like, what is that smell? It's familiar. And I was like, it smells like, like slightly salted, um, roasted peanut shells. <laughs> <laughs> like I, you know, without the training of or like what I've been trying to train myself and of like smelling and tasting, I, I wouldn't have gotten there so quickly. But to open up that um, world right. has been interesting. So I, I guess like linked to that is that like this culture has a, vo a huge vocabulary for taste and smell and like maybe say like from just experience that japan japan has like words for these little moments that don't exist in our language and so mm -hmm. you know when you when you give it um i guess i'm just interested back to my art like trying to visually show a feeling that there are no words for mm. um okay now the it th there's there's a r a lot of significant overlap with a lot of um, digging that I'm doing in my own life mm -hmm. right now. That's really interesting. There, um, the f the first kind of question is is a not introspective, but kind of introspective question, I guess. So like we're able to say there's a culture where the unique thing about their language is it's it has a high degree of pull from olfactory senses, mm -hmm. right? Pretend you're in that culture and you're describing our culture. Hmm. What do we pull from? Oh, I like that. Money. Money. It's <laughs> I, I mean, what else? What else <laughs> defines our culture that we all do to the nth degree? Things that we mm -hmm. don't want to do, but get paid to do it for. Like yeah. we give away our lives mm -hmm. in ways that we do not enjoy sometimes, yeah. but it's okay because we get a series of ones and zeros or some paper with drawings on it yeah. that the rest of our culture respects as actually being something when yeah. it's not. That's the weird thing to me. <laughs> it's like what you really have is time and you're trading that for kind of like brownie points within the society mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very odd thing when you when you let it sink in yeah but I, I think it's part of why i never really got a normal job or i would fall apart in a normal job mm -hmm. as a horrible employee so what was your most normal job oh uh i worked at an architect's office for a summer and boy that was miserable um and Did i you was, have training in that or yeah, my background's in architecture. I, I have my master's and practiced for three years. Uh, but even the people that had to work with me after school within that three years mm -hmm. would would probably tell you that, yeah, he was never going to do good at this kind of work environment mm -hmm. because it for me, it was extremely uh, limiting, confining, claustrophobic. And it just it didn't feel like I would much rather make my way walking into the woods somewhere and trying to build a log cabin and survive off of that rather than give up and strap myself to a desk and receive good compensation. But on on a consistent level, that consistency from my personality is what scared me. Mm -hmm. But from other people I interact with, I ask them about it and they say that the consistency gives them comfort. 
Hmm. But for me, it makes me extremely uncomfortable. Hmm. At the same time, if I had too much inconsistency in my life, I'm sure it would get very uncomfortable. But yeah, yeah. But uh, architect's office. I worked in a deli for a summer. I worked as a waiter. I worked in a pallet factory making pallets for a while. That was, ooh, that was so bad. It was dark. There was no windows, and they had a forklift going the whole time with like hardly any ventilation. Very bad lighting. And people that could do the monotonous same thing all day, every day, as far as like just keeping their head down and nailing things on. Yeah. I'm glad there's people that can do that because we need pallets. But for me, it was extremely, um, extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to describe it better than that. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked as like a, what did I, I sold snowboards in like a Dick's Sporting Goods or like Sport Authority huh. type place, which was really weird because they, there, there'd be like absolutely nothing to do, but you couldn't sit down. <laughs> so you just always had to stand and look around like there was something to do when there wasn't. Um, then I worked for an architect after school for three years, working towards being an architect. Uh -huh. um, that's those are that's kind of the run. Of, I mean, I worked at a summer camp off and on. I worked as a high school teacher for a while. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> Those are that's quite it's a good portfolio of normal jobs. <laughs> yeah, I I I know enough to know I don't want a, a normal job. I I definitely want the challenge of risk and to me that's where you get more reward is when there's risk. Mm -hmm. And if I'm signing on as a consistent thing for me it's too it's too confining. I mm -hmm. need a little bit of fear to to make me interested enough to continue to participate. Mm -hmm. And with being self-employed, there's constant slight wear of fear uh, to motivate you to you better keep marketing because mm -hmm. no one's, uh, a, you know, obliged to give you money all the time mm -hmm. if they don't hear about you, respect what you do and want you to do it. Mm -hmm. So in everything I do, I'm constantly reminded that you could go back to working in a pallet factory and that's not going to be fun. So there, there's that motivation, which I, which I think is a really healthy thing for, mm -hmm. for someone to go through, especially if they're going into a creative field like photography or architecture or being an artist that you, you do know that there's failure at the door constantly because mm -hmm. that's the truth. Um, but it, it sharpens your, uh, I think that sharpens your focus in your drive and and everything else so mm -hmm. how about yourself what's the most normal worst job you've ever had <laughs> oh my gosh um well first um there was a car your parents came by and they said that they saw your car up front is are you the toyota tacoma with the that would be or, tim oh, i uh, have the tan minivan yeah. oh okay which is great because i always forget to re register my car so i'll go like a year without with bad tags, but no yeah. one looks at a tan minivan. <laughs> I get by, but yeah, I have, I have a tan minivan and then we have a, I have a truck that I use to tow a boat and we have a camper that slides in it, but that's my work vehicle. So yeah, I don't too highly identify with it other than trying to excuse owning it with, I forget to register my plate. So it's a good thing. <laughs> I don't know. I tried that with putting a baby on board. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it didn't it didn't work. <laughs> didn't go over. So mm. baby on board is no longer a sticker on my car. <laughs> They'll get yeah. They'll get um, yeah. Yeah. But um I noticed the the four thousand footer sticker on his car and um ah. for hiking and so I guess the most normal job I guess I had was um I got a quick job at Dunkin' Donuts um ah. for a couple months. Um because I was preparing to hike the Appalachian Trail and I oh, cool. needed like a, a quick, like, here's some extra cash and then I can just quit and not feel bad. <laughs> right. Um, so did yeah, you do the Appalachian sorry. Trail? I did, yeah. The whole uh, thing? The whole thing. Not uh, a lot of people George, finish that George start. A lot of people do now, I believe. Really? It's getting, I mean. Did you do it during there. COVID? Um, no, no, this was, okay. I'm a has-been, it was so long ago, uh, <laughs> 2010, yeah. Oh, wow, Now, cool. like, if I if I was hiking and I saw three hikers, I just would be like, I'm going to remain anonymous, whereas before I'd be like, I hiked the trail. <laughs> but no, I think that it's it's so hiked now, and there it's like, yeah, it's it was a great time. What did you learn from that experience? I mean, that is a long time to be 
detached from day-to-day -day normal life mm. to be just walking in the woods for that long. I imagine it's got to be quite a come down at the end. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely learned that I love to be alone and with my thoughts. Um, you did it alone. But, um, I did it with a friend at the time. I mean, a, a boyfriend at the time. Um, and he kept hiking. Just he's He has like 15,000 miles under his feet. Um, and we're still good friends. But um, yeah, so I, I did it with a boyfriend. And like that was really rad and it was like a good partnership but um yeah I would um I don't know it was something I just always wanted to accomplish it felt really great to do it and then I felt like I was it was like behind me and I could like do the next thing that I dreamed of but right. it felt really good at a younger age to just like check off something that I dreamed of um huh yeah no that that seems like I've always interacted with people that they'll come up with ideas and they're like, I'm gonna fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And I find that it seems like 80% of the people never actually follow through on even starting those things that yeah. they say, I'm going to fill yeah. in the blank. And it, it's kind of sad, but when they were people that were intersecting with my life, in the back of my head, I'd be like, I'm glad you have that idea, but I know you're never going to do it. Yeah. I'll encourage you, and but I'm not actually going to form my life around what I know you're not actually going to do, which seems like a really arrogant position <laughs> and kind of condescending on my part, I guess. But I don't know. Well, it's good to protect your energy. <laughs> yeah, to some degree, I guess. <laughs> but that, that, that time doing that how did that play into what you have in front of you as an artist um i mean i i knew that i i was currently in art school and um taking a year off and i knew i wanted to return and continue on that path um and actually um one of my along the way, like I'm always collecting things, usually natural objects, like things that I find on the ground. In my house, I collect my cat's whiskers when they lose them. <laughs> um, but so on this hike, I um, there were butterflies that were migrating north and um, sometime where I was in hiking through Virginia, they were like just so many butterflies and they're like, you know, not all of them make them make it like a bird will get them. And then just there'll be a, a wing on the trail, like a fallen leaf. And so I'd pick them up and put them in my journal. And they literally just sat in my journal for like 10 years. And um, then I, you know, I was getting rid of things and I um, took out the butterfly wings and started photographing them. And that's um, where I got my butterfly wings from my um dust to dust series yeah that's that, cool um i'll be showing some images of that from in the main home and design yeah. yeah huh that uh it i've always decorated my house with stuff that i've gotten from real experiences that i've done uh -huh. and it's it's been interesting it's been a little annoying for the the people that have to live with me that don't as much want to uh decorate from <laughs> from experience but rather pick something they like and put it on the wall to me having yeah. that experience connected with the thing that you look at reminds you of that experience and and has a yeah a truer connection or something to it that yeah. that has always been more of an experience for me to to interact with it visually like what's an example of something that you have in your home? like i got my wife a a a cowbell from Austria when I was there and it was just a place I was at where I saw things and it, it, just the entire experience of it had a feeling and I remember thinking of her in that moment and I was like I should get her something and you know it's it, these very unique cowbell things but it's interesting how she processes the world she just didn't have that same kind of appreciation or connection to things that she visually decorates with Mm -hmm. in in that manner mm -hmm. it's more i think 
I think she maybe pulls from more of an idealistic point of view of like why she's going to put something up to look at mm -hmm. is more from an ideology rather than an experiential thing. But mm -hmm. I'm totally shooting from the hip here. So, yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think? What what is what is we were talking about this earlier, but your idea of like what are emotions and why do we need to talk about them? Like, why do we need words for an emotion? Like what what are what are these things emotions like I, I've, I'm struggling with that myself? Yeah. Like, why do we receive feelings from experience and and what do we do with them? I don't have the answer for that. What's that? <laughs> I said, I don't have the answer for that. Do you? <laughs> right. But you're exploring that as an artist. Yeah. Well, so I guess like my artwork is 100% cathartic. It's solely for me. So I'm exploring like certain emotions that I want to. I, I, I'm always conceptually driven. I begin with this idea, this concept and try to create it into a form. Um, but then I then it's up to the viewer. I never want to tell them what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. Like I'm always hesitant to give something a title or to even share the medium that I'm working with because I want people to just see it the way from their experiences. Like if, you know, if for example, um, my dust to dust series, um, there are these sculptures, um, and I'll tell you the the medium is it's these um well not all of it but um, they are figurines that I thrifted and collected secondhand um, so they were once like cherished objects but I think they're really spooky <laughs> like when you I um, like when I go to Goodwill, say, just walking down the aisle, like I just kind of feel this haunting feeling from all these cherished objects that have had their different lives and like they all have their stories to tell. But I kind of chose the ones, chose certain ones to tell a, a certain story and I bound them together and then I covered them in layers and layers of ash and that has its own meaning to me and i got so much unexpected joy out of people's responses anywhere from like like wow these are heavy like they feel like a relic that you would uncover in pompeii um like a figure that you would uncover from pompeii and then other people said they remind me of sandcastles and so <laughs> like I just think that's awesome. Like Do you feel that there's um that that there's something attached able to be a I mean, and this gets in a very woo-woo spiritual kind of sense, but mm -hmm. do you feel that there's something that's able to be attached to a thing from a person interacting with it emotionally or anything else? I mean, this is total total shooting from the hip but i mean <laughs> no, what, I, what's your take on that i'm totally into that I because think you're going down an aisle or... looking at something and you yeah. get a feeling from a thing right for some reason do you, you ever know? get that i i feel very little um i feel very little outside of personal connection to people huh but I definitely feel a sense of uh, presence or um, how would you say it? These are the words that I need to. Yeah. So I definitely like a space makes me feel a certain way. And, mm -hmm. and I choose how I feel supposedly. I don't know that I quite agree with that. But like if I'm in a space that's ordered in a certain way, I have a certain level of anxiety to me. If I'm in a space that has a different set of ordering and aesthetic appearance to it, mm -hmm. it, it encourages in me a different sense of emotional being. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that um, like some spirit or whatever has been imbued into that space. Mm -hmm. To me, I read that more as a... Um, uh, an accumulation of a thousand different decisions that went into making a thing look the mm -hmm. way it does that meant something 
to the thing that formed whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So sharp angles, sharp edges, to me, communicate a certain thing. Mm -hmm. If I see that in a figurine and it's really spiky and uh, that that mm -hmm. to me is going to feel like, you know, like an urchin is like, you better not step on me or else, you know, you're going to you're going to hate your life. Mm -hmm. um, but spaces in the same way, like an urchin communicates something with how it looks. Mm -hmm. Spaces communicate something with how they look. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I definitely pick up on that. It's what I focus on. <laughs> no mm -hmm. pen intended. It's what I focus on all the time while I'm working. And it, I really feel it like with my own home, if things are out of order or messy, it, it's really hard for me to be present and not agitated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I came that. home the other day from a long shoot and there, there were more people at my house than I expected, which when I first realized that I was like, oh, cool, I get to see, you know, so-and-so again. Yeah. But then the actual reality of it was that I was really exhausted and the house was a little messy. Uh -huh. And so when I went inside, the emotions I started to be confronted with were just, I'm, I want to be alone in a clean space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know. What, how do you feel about people interacting with things and then something being left with that thing that then you're, you're perceiving something from and turning it into art? Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with you on space and the feeling of it um, and the space that I need to exist in being a certain way. Um, but yeah, I just, um, I don't know. I feel like there's just like energy left in every object that's passed on. And sometimes it's good energy. Sometimes it's bad. Um, Do you go to like estate sales? Um, no, I haven't done estate sales before. I guess I've just kind of, I haven't gotten, I shouldn't get further into this. <laughs> I need to put a cap at it. I mean, it's, that's a, a series that I have behind me, have behind me. So, um, I shouldn't be collecting more junk like that. <laughs> do you have a uh, collection propensity? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, like, do you, do you start to collect lots and lots of things if you're not careful? Um, earlier in life, yes, but now I've really enjoyed simplicity and choosing the right objects to be surrounded by. Um, right. Like you said, you moved out of a house that you were in for 13 years and um, like I was just in a house for five years, but I really learned from moving from one space to another, like what I want to surround myself with. Right. The previous house, I definitely collected a lot and didn't realize how 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 I like I was like an organized hoarder or like I um I curated my hoarding so you didn't really notice it until I started packing boxes and I was like ah, <laughs> I don't need this and um but yeah I guess I think about the weight an object holds often like. Um, uh, like the earliest experience is just like stealing my sister's sweatshirt and putting it on and just being like, I'm so cool. I feel just like my sister. Older sister. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my wife's younger sister would take my wife's clothes, I think, and uh -huh. like hide them under her bed and wear them. <laughs> and my, I think my wife found them and was like, what are you doing? Like, oh, nothing. <laughs> but. Hopefully they don't listen to this. I might I, divulge something I should know. I can relate. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't remember. Where That's I was all right. Going with. So it it's just a really interesting. So I have this theory that, and now you have you have a baby that you either procured or made yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't we didn't distinguish that? But um, I procured a baby. <laughs> I Sorry. made Asa. He, um, he's my baby. You go like when a child. I've been talking to a lot of people about this recently. When you're when you're born, you're basically tripping balls. So a baby has extreme dendrite connection in the brain cells uh, in their brain between uh -huh. the cells, uh -huh. and so there's it. They're essentially tripping at that point where every part of the brain is connected to every other part. So a smell will activate vision, 
emotion, everything. And that's huh. why it's so hard to emotionally control a baby to, to some degree. And, and I'm improperly repeating stuff I've heard elsewhere. I haven't done this research myself, obviously, uh -huh. but anyways, it's, it's a thing, I guess. So wait, are you speaking about like a, a like a newborn baby yes, or a newborn like baby for how long? Well, that's the thing. They're they're kind of looking into this. But like when you're born, you're a hundred percent emotion. You have no ability to like speak about a feeling uh -huh. you're having, uh -huh. right? It's just like, ah, I have a pin sticking in my butt. Can you please get it out? Uh -huh. Or, you know, ah, I've pooped in my diaper and it's uncomfortable. Uh -huh. So you can only really emotionally perceive at that point. But as you go along in life, you accumulate these things to articulate emotions into very specific sounds that we call words right mm -hmm. so you can eventually say this diaper is you know these peanuts are making me thirsty but you you slowly go from fully emotion mm -hmm. to potentially fully without emotion and being completely articulate mm -hmm. but lacking emotion and in my life i got to a point where i realized i'd become far too uh, ration and logic mm -hmm. and, and had left emotion behind to some degree. And that, that was a difficult place to come to and a difficult thing to, to remedy. But, uh, it's interesting that as like, if someone's been gone through a traumatic experience mm -hmm. to talk about that experience, uh, to put it into words, to translate it from emotion to articulate word, over time, that experience that you had has mm -hmm. less effect on your life because you've talked about it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what uh, uh, therapy and counseling and everything else is. Mm -hmm. Now, in the same way, if someone goes through a spiritual experience, a positive emotional experience to some degree, I'd imagine, uh, as they talk about it, that too has less effect on them over time, the more they talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so to some degree, what you're doing maybe is killing emotion, but I don't think it has to be that way. I, there's something about uh, naming an emotion that's obviously extremely valuable to us as humans. Yeah. I think there's just a, an ability of like, how do we use this? Yeah. So we don't articulate everything and lose the emotional presence. Yeah. I'm... Yeah, I'm definitely into that thought. I, I don't think that everything should be named, but I, I do. Now, why shouldn't everything Wait. be named? That's a good statement. Well, or maybe we need to just like, a, maybe there just needs to be like a collective um, area where we can gather situations that don't have words for them. <laughs> Oh, but then how would you gather them? <laughs> I don't know. That's interesting. I know that there was, um, it was like the dictionary of infinite sorrows. Um, I, I, there was a um, TED talk. I heard about it. And um, so some, somebody was putting words to certain things and sometimes make, making like little films um, I was really interested in it, but it, it kind of got like too literal and silly for me. So I, I was like, this is ruining the, what I want it to be. I'm just going to imagine it. But what's your next uh, on, on light, somewhat lighter subject? What's your next um, what's your next thing that you're focusing on that has you interested in with art? Um, a couple things. Um, I'm you will have to move a little closer to the microphone oh, there else we sorry. won't hear you. A couple you. things. Um, <laughs> actually, like just with the, um, the pandemic and uh, I was laid off and I guess it's been somewhat what of it aligned, aligned pretty well because I've my kid was in daycare and so now I get to spend my days home with him um, trying to make that work as long as we possibly can but the reality is is that I've got to come up with the next step and so um, I've really been focusing on um, I've always wanted to have a, a product to sell a, a like a line and a product and um, so just recently or the, over the past six months say um, I started um, 
teaching myself how to sew lingerie. So that that's my next thing. And if like hand stitching or like you're using uh, a, like a sewing machine. Okay. But um, it's I love tricky. Sewing, by it's the way. So yeah, it's it's very challenging. Um, I've always sewed, but never stretchy fabrics and like so delicate ah. and small. And um, I just I have this story I want to tell this type of person that is a part of me, but also like a part that I dream of being. And um, so I'm currently working on that. And maybe by October, I'll have something on the site. Um, there you go. The, um, it's called Blue Nude, which is inspired by uh, Matisse's Blue, N Blue Nude series. Um, and so Blue Nude Lingerie dot com is my website um and yeah by then i hope to be launching at least my first set um but it i probably seems like that's such a curveball from the art that you expected to be talking about yeah no that <laughs> i mean you're, you're still I creating and, and and making things that are you know i that that's interesting like yeah because it, it seems like such a regardless always going to be a mass manufactured type of thing mm -hmm. no i definitely want it to be uh handmade by me that's something that's really important to me um and would this be where you're like I interacting with individuals to create something for them or just completely creating your own line um creating my own line and i i'm sure that like i, I would love to open it up for custom fittings because there are all bodies and I want to be able to reach out to the largest audience I can but there's always like you can't be everything to everybody too so I'm trying to find that balance like who like I I just um you know what one day my dream is that it's not just like targeted towards um excuse me targeted towards like someone with a femme body I want to be able to reach anybody who wants to be a part of this feeling like my brand. Um, I want anybody to experience it, but, hmm. um, like one step at a time, I guess I'll start with the, the world I live in, like the, who I am and get to the next step. But yeah, it's definitely, it's been really interesting. I've pushed myself to, or it's given me, a like we've been, so confined for the past year and a half and um i haven't been able to like meet all sorts of people but this is i've like really gotten a good education on identity and um trying to like understand how i want to speak about myself how i want to speak about other people and like ways to be the most inclusive and that was something that like hasn't been like i never been challenged in that way. And it's awesome. Um, through my lingerie brand, I'm challenging myself on that. Now, uh, now how do you, with something like, that's an interesting complexity, like with something like lingerie, our, our minds, I think are trained to go to, well, the ideal figure, like uh -huh. we have collectively an ideal that, that changes over centuries, mm -hmm. obviously, but how how do you being being an individual like starting out rather than a big corporation that can have tons of different body types come in to measure and everything else mm -hmm. how do you how do you design lingerie for the normal person rather than the ideal body type like because mm -hmm. i would think that would be a, a a bit of a um potentially a bit of an awkward conversation to find someone that's Hey, you're not the ideal body type. I'd love to design lingerie for you. You know, like there's a potential offense, but like, mm -hmm. or a like, no, I'd totally be into that. That'd be great. I've been looking for something like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like the, an advantage of social media is to just oh, put yeah, the true. word out there. Like, Hey, I'm in search of like a, this certain body type, um, to, try out a new style and like I want to fit it to your body and um so I think that there you can reach out to people and they'll come find you right um because yeah like they're 
not everybody's interested in being a part of it. And so it, it's easier to just put the word out yeah, and hope yeah, that someone totally. will come to you. <laughs> I mean, I'm finding with, with people I know, um, they'll modify their own genes. Uh -huh. Like they'll take them to seamstresses and everything else to like, these fit me great here, uh -huh. but not here. And yeah. if I get ones that fit me here, they're too big here or they're too tight there and they're too big here, you know? Yeah. And that they'll buy like a normal pair of jeans, but then have to go modify them to, you know, to be able to fit how it makes them feel confident, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that, that, uh, I wonder what the, I'm, now my mind's going like business model, like how do you make money on that? And how do you stay alive in our society the where we value money so much in a situation like that that's not based primarily on smells? So yeah, social media. Social media. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a, a really great venture and um, I I'm so excited. Like, I, I, I feel like it relates to my art because I'm definitely starting with this concept, this feeling or idea that I want to have somebody else experience. Hmm. Um, and yeah, like I've like I could name songs that would fit to my brand or I could name oh, like cool. scents. Like I, I, I guess I it's all all the senses into just making lingerie. <laughs> Now, the difference between lingerie and standard underwear is that it mm -hmm. would be more presentation to then interaction. Um, no, not really. I no? actually just love the word. I mean, sure. but I need a little bit of schooling I, on this, honestly. Yeah. So. I just love the word lingerie. Like, yeah. I, there's great. I, I did entertain this. Like, there's uh, under things would be a more inclusive under word <laughs> um, that like inclusive to everybody and it's a, a, a broader term. So, but I, I just couldn't give up the word lingerie. <laughs> I just want to say it every day. <laughs> I like part, part of it is just this fascination with France and Paris. And I just want right. to always feel that connection. So um, I'm giving myself artistic permission to whatever the de true definition of lingerie is i'm i'm making my own definition it might be more like under things like you know even if i'm I'm not going to be doing this but like even if i'm making like thermal shorts and a tank top like i'm gonna call it lingerie <laughs> main lingerie, <laughs> yeah, main lingerie. <laughs> plaid <laughs> for a while you're chopping trees down yes. and want to feel nice about yourself <laughs> yes um yeah, because that's a, that's a interesting, um, it's an interesting design problem, not in a technical sense, but in an emotional aesthetic sense, like mm -hmm. the aesthetics of what you're wearing that no one really sees, but you or someone you're going to be intimate with. Mm -hmm. How do you design those things? Or like, what is the, what is the aesthetic of that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not something for everyone. It's for first and foremost, that single individual and anyone who they then potentially intimately present themselves to. So it, mm -hmm. it creates this very, uh, it, it's like an intimate identity in a way. Hmm. Yeah. And it's, I just, I'm, I'm verbalizing that because like, I'm, I'm thinking then, all right, I'm, I'm envisioning how how do I think about how someone wants to present themselves when they're only really presenting this to someone that they are are you know going to be interacting with or uh -huh. or desire or like yeah I there's an interesting I thing be there like more visible like I want it to I just wish like recently I've been you know the few times I do go out I push myself to um, like have more of my under things exposed in a tasteful way. Like mm -hmm. you're showing your socks right now. I was actually <laughs> thinking that because like when I think about like what you're saying, like what I maybe think a, a woman would potentially relate to laundry and underwear, like uh -huh. I don't really care personally about underwear as long as it functions right. Yeah. But like when I think about socks, I'm like, these are gonna be shown, but they're just gonna be shown a little bit. Yeah. And I'm gonna say a lot about how little I want to interact with society for me personally uh -huh. by my socks. <laughs> like I don't agree with everything that you guys are doing here, 
And I'm gonna say that with my socks. It's just a really <laughs> odd thing, you know? So it, yeah, I, like you're expressing yourself with yeah, that like little yeah. slice of your personality. And right. like, I want to find ways to do that same thing with under things um, to like, just celebrate them a, a little more than what I've ever been comfortable with or, you know, just kind of w what's no a little more than what's been normal. Hmm. Um, so today I'm wearing like a slightly transparent shirt. Yeah. And I don't know if that showed up in the photographs or on film, but we'll I hope it does. <laughs> a little more contrast. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's like what um, I want to play with that comfort um i just combined the words that confidence and comfort level and um just celebrate under things more huh I'm, i'll be interested to see where that goes that's uh <laughs> it from it's it's a it's a odd thing for me to interact with coming from such a conservative like background mm -hmm. but at the same time i remember as a kid going to church and like these church ladies would wear these very translucent like white blouses mm -hmm. that would have um oh uh that would have like you could see their bra straps and you could see the shoulder pads <laughs> under there you know and i love shoulder pads it was so weird and i was like yeah, it, it was a weird thing because I'd look at it and be like, I can see their underwear in places, but it's really not appealing. And I didn't, you know, as a kid, you're, you know, you're looking at people my age now and you're like, ooh, what's going on there? I don't, yeah, that's well, an odd cheers thing. to them. They, they're the, um, I don't think they knew they were doing that. <laughs> I, I don't know what to make of that. It was, it was an odd thing, but anyways, we've been going for two hours oh, apparently. So. And I had an appointment at 3.30. Yeah. I, I didn't think we'd go two hours. So, oh, I was um, so nervous I would swear, and I don't think I did. Oh, would, would you like to? <laughs> you, you can go right ahead. Oh, well, just I, just, let oh, I almost said shit when we had been going for two hours. There we go. I was and like, with shoot. that, we'll end. <laughs> well, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming down and talking with us. I really enjoyed it. Well, and you, uh, I look, look forward to everything you're going to be putting out coming up. So thank you. Check out uh, Lindsay Stone. Uh, uh, what's your website address? So my um, my art website is lindsayjoystone.com and then my uh, lingerie brand is bluenudelingerie.com. Cool. And Instagram or anything for your art and all that or yep. that you want people to go to? Um, sometimes or it's mostly, well, okay. So it's um, lindsayjoystone or at lindsayjoystone, right? Yeah. That's there you how, go. That's Instagram. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.